Hello and welcome to our virtual coffee talk, Cryptocurrency Tax Developments. Before our webinar begins today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. In case you did not know, you can earn one CPE credit by attending our presentation today. To, re to receive the credit, you must stay connected to the webinar for the entire presentation and participate by responding to at least three of our interactive questions. You will receive an email within two to four business days with instructions on how to access your CPE cert certificate. We also invite you to complete the course evaluation that will occur at the end of the webinar. We appreciate any feedback that you give us. And now on to our presentation. Great, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited about this month's topic. Um, we're going to be talking about the hot topic of cryptocurrency, and, and really it's a hot topic because, as we'll be discussing throughout this panel, there's not much guidance out there, and so we're really struggling to figure out how things should be handled. What is the IRS going to say? And it's beyond the IRS because it's also what are individual states going to possibly say, as well as what is the foreign jurisdictions, including the OECD, possibly going to say. And so... Really, it's a matter of saying, as you can see on this agenda, it's a rather ambitious agenda of talking about, okay, what is cryptocurrency? And what do we talk about when we're saying mining or staking rewards? And how do we have to report these things, right? I mean, tax functions on a reporting regime and in part it's self-reliance, but also it's in part on information reporting that has to be provided. Then we have, we're gonna turn our attention to token compensation and then the Green Book proposals. And as always, we're gonna wrap up with Kevin DeYoung say, showing us how Answer Connect can help us do research on the cryptocurrency. Uh, really excited of, of my co-panelists that are joining me today. Uh, my fellow partner at Alvarez and Marcel, Chris Catarba, who specializes in uh, cryptocurrency. And also Liz Chien, from Protocol Labs is going to be able to join us for the first half of today's presentation. Really excited to hear what she's seeing as well as the involvement she has in OECD and the reporting and what she's observing from the market shift. Uh, so with that, um, I wanted to sort of jump right in and I guess, Chris, for those in the audience that haven't really had much familiarity with cryptocurrency, you know, where did cryptocurrency begin? Where did it come from? How does it work? What does it actually mean to say, hey, let's talk about crypto? Yeah, thanks, Kevin, for inviting me. Um, so cryptocurrency really started uh, 2008. Um, there was a white paper issued by uh, somebody named uh, Natashi Nokomoto uh, proposing uh, a new type of uh, coin called Bitcoin which um, was actually supposed to address the problem that uh, we were having with uh, making payments. And anybody knows about payment issues, when you go to make a wire, it takes you know five business days to clear, especially if you're trying to do a cross-border wire. Uh, it takes a long time. Uh, and then also there's a lot of fees involved in making uh, payments as well. And so the idea of, of Bitcoin was can we cut out the intermediaries, the banks, the credit card companies, uh, everyone, you know, trying to take their, their share? And can we have uh, instead a system where these transactions can be validated um, by uh, a group of, you know, computers? Um, and that way we can, you know, have a less, uh, you know, more quicker payments and, and more cheaper payments. And so that was the, the general premise behind uh, Bitcoin and, and, and cryptocurrencies uh, in general. Um, what happened was is that, you know, the payment uh, mechanism didn't really take off. I mean, they're still trying to do that uh, in various forms, various companies. But people realized that underneath what Bitcoin was proposing was this idea of a blockchain. Um, and a blockchain is really uh, a distributed ledger which, you know, for any of you that are accountants should, should really appreciate this. And it, it's really a, a, a long stream of blocks and that keep a record forever uh, of every transaction that's validated um, through this system. And so 
uh, the underlying technology showed a lot of promise uh, for all types of different, um, you know, ways and variations to, to use this. And so the cryptocurrency scene has now grown into all different types of, uh, you know, ways to, to use this technology and a lot of uh, development is being done on this right now. And so, you know, we've grown a lot since 2008. Um, there's many different token types. There's security tokens, utility tokens, there's stable coins, which is a, uh, and you know, hot issue right now. Governance tokens, which provide you with voting rights, um, and so lots of different applications of this. But the bottom line is that you know these tokens are used as uh, really incentives uh, for validating these transactions um, through different types of consensus mechanisms that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and uh, that's kind of where we stand today. Great. That's you know, really helpful. And I guess, as I mentioned in the intro, there really isn't much guidance in this area, right? It's sort of, in many respects, taxpayers and their advisors are left trying to figure out how do we treat cryptocurrency and the host of fashions that the, trans, the range of transactions that they engage in. So I guess, where do we stand right now from guidance and what are we looking for? Yeah, so... The best guidance we have is a little bit outdated. From 2014, there was a notice issued by the IRS on what they call virtual currency, um, which is a unique term that I don't see anywhere except used by the IRS. And the idea was that um, these virtual currencies uh, would all be treated as property for tax purposes um, and not as currency, even though they have the name currency. Uh, in the title. And so this was a, you know, a unique, unique sort of position to take. Um, and, you know, what results from that are uh, any general tax rules and principles that would follow from the treatment of, of other types of property. So, you know, for example, simple case, if you sell a coin uh, and you have a built-in gain and you receive cash in exchange, well, that built-in game is going to be taxable to, to yourself. And whether that's treated as a uh, capital gain or ordinary depends on, you know, how you hold the token, whether as a capital asset uh, or as some sort of ordinary business property. Um, so that's a pretty straightforward example of, of the tax rules. What people don't all also realize is that if you exchange or swap a token for another token, that's also a taxable uh, event. Um, and this actually happens a lot in the crypto space where people are moving in and out of different tokens on different blockchains. And every time that happens, there's a taxable event that occurs and gain or loss needs to be recognized and reported, uh, which obviously can be a nightmare to keep track of. Um, and then finally, what people also don't realize is if you use cryptocurrency to purchase goods or services, that also is a taxable uh, event and if there's a built-in gain in the token that you're giving up, that also has to be uh, recorded and reported. Um, and so a lot of you know retailers are accepting you know cryptocurrency as payment, and so people just need to be aware of that there's income tax owed uh, at each one of these uh, exchanges. Um, I'll also mention that uh, in terms of you know tracking. Uh, all of these transactions, you need to, to be uh, wary what your cost basis is. And cost basis methods are, you know, based upon, you know, uh, typically last in, first out, LIFO. Uh, you can also specifically identify a token that's being sold if you think you can get a better tax advantage that way and you have good uh, books and records to support that. Um, but, you know, you need to pick, pick a method and, and stick to it. Um, and, you know, at the end of the tax year, it does become a little bit problematic to try to keep track of all this. But the good news is there are, uh, you know, certain software uh, programs that can assist with this. Yeah, and Chris, I, I will say on that point in terms of the, um, you know, keeping track of your basis, uh, the IRS in an FAQ does provide that you can um, elect. So the default method is FIFO, first in, first out. Um, and uh, but taxpayers, if they 
keep proper documentation, meaning you segregate your crypto with particular bases into its own uh, you know, separately identifiable wallet, um, then uh, taxpayers may rely on the tax basis of that lot that's like separately kept. Um, you know, I've heard recently that um, there are certain pack taxpayers using HIFO, which is highest in, first out. And to be clear, that's not something that um, is generally uh, sort of used in the US as a method. Um, and it's certainly not one that I've heard the IRS, um, you know, sort of bless um, in any means. Um, it's one that's obviously very beneficial for the taxpayer from a tax perspective, but I guess I would characterize it as um, being a pretty significantly high risk. Um, and it's something that taxpayers should certainly consult with your tax advisors on before electing that method. Great, so that's really helpful. And you know, it's it's really interesting when you're starting to think about all the different places that Chris highlighted that you can be having an income realization event, right? On the sales, on the swaps, on the purchase, you're now using it. The fact that it's viewed as property, but it's not a like-kind exchange, so I can't say, hey, I'm going from this currency to another currency. Um, being mindful of that, I, I guess, Liz, in the industry, there's a lot of talk of, of mining and staking and how does it interplay? And I guess from your perspective, you know, can you give us a, a sort of a high level view of mining versus staking and where things are and, and how they compare? Sure, Kevin. Um, so so Chris, Chris uh, uh, introduced uh, this idea of consensus mechanisms um, on, in, the, um, in the first slide. And mining and staking are just sort of two uh, ways that uh, these blockchains validate um, a transaction. And so, um, or try to obtain consensus in the blockchain that a, a validation, uh, or that a, a uh, you know, sort of all the components of it have, have been validated and can um, be verified. And primarily in many of these uh, protocols, what the what the validator is trying to validate is that the sender is not sending more token than it actually has so you may you know if when you look at the materials um, on crypto and um, sort of these different validation protocols you see people talking about the double spend issue um, and so that's exactly what it is it's these these uh, validation protocols are intended to ensure that a sender is not double spending its balance um, and so uh, the Bitcoin protocol uh, relies primarily on um, mining, which is, uh, I think the easiest way to describe it is sort of solving very hard math problems um, using a lot of computing power. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and that's sort of how it verify, verifies transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, staking is a, a more recent validation method or validation um, sort of uh, approach that um, many protocols are now moving towards just because they recognize uh, some of the uh, challenges, especially related to um, energy consumption of the uh, more traditional mining validation protocols. And so with staking, the idea is that um, a, a validator that has a large stake in the uh, protocol's underlying native token uh, will uh, be rewarded the uh, work of doing the validation to confirm that a transaction um, you know, uh, meets all the criteria. Um, and then uh, and then we'll proceed to essentially validate the transaction, which is typically which typically sort of manifests itself in the creation of a new block on the blockchain. Um, now that's at a very high level. Many of these different staking protocols um, are, you know, no one protocol is exactly the same um, unless it's, you know, an exact sort of like fork off of another protocol, um, but they're all somewhat similar and, and share um, common characteristics. But in terms of taxation of these rewards that you get for performing these validation services through mining, the IRS did come out in an FAQ related to uh, self-employment income to say that um, if an individual, if a taxpayer is receiving mining rewards um, for running one of these Bitcoin validators or one of these mining validators, then those rewards should be treated as services income 
and subject to um, you know all the taxes that a self-employed taxpayer needs to comply with. Uh, I think with staking, um, you know, this is more recent. So uh, I would say, you know, the first um, staking protocols really came out just within the last five years. Whereas if we look at sort of the guidance and the notice, um, it's much older than that. But uh, with staking rewards, there, because um, the validator is required to uh, have and to hold, right, whether itself as a tax as the tax owner of those assets or having another owner sort of delegate the right uh, to use those assets, uh, it, the validator has to hold quite a large stake in that particular token um, in order to, uh, to win, right, win these, um, these uh, validation. Uh, the, the work to perform the validation and to then subsequently earn the reward. So it is a slightly different fact pattern. Um, I do think with staking, what's interesting is that because it's not so clear that it's really just somebody, you know, sort of performing a, a validation service on a protocol, there is a, a component of it where somebody almost has to bring their own inputs to production into the service, right? That it does cause um, the then question of character of the subsequent reward that is given by the protocol uh, for providing the validation service, it does, you know, cause there to be some really interesting tax questions as to what is it, right? Like, I think, you know, the more conservative approach would be to treat it akin to mining rewards, so services income. But because there is that component that the validators need to actually bring in their own production inputs to a certain extent, does that in any way change the character? Does it change the character to something more akin to production, right? Some, some, something that is self, a self-created, self-created property, um, some type of production related, um, production related uh, generated income. So I think that's what's uh, currently the uh, controversy around the question of the character of staking rewards. To date, there's no guidance. Um, many of you may have read uh, that. Um, there's a case called uh, uh, the Jarrett case, which was brought by uh, individual taxpayers that were running uh, a, um, a validator for the Tezos protocol. So Tezos is one of the um, alternative tokens um, that's available. And, um, and you know, it was really over about $3,000 uh, worth of uh, staking rewards. Um, they wanted to take the position that uh, those staking rewards should actually be treated as production income, which means that our self-created property so that um, the tax event doesn't actually occur until those assets are actually disposed of. So the difference would be that, you know, if it's treated as services income, then it's taxed when it's earned versus when it's taxed when it's disposed of. So uh, so the Jarrett's essentially... Uh, you know, they filed a tax return uh, where they treated it as services income, paid the tax, and then they turned around and filed a refund claim, and then sued to, uh, uh, you know, sued on the on the uh, position that the IRS needed to provide a refund because this was actually uh, the staking rewards were uh, self-created property, personal property. Um, what the IRS did was they just then gave the refund but um, would not actually argue the merits of the case. So uh, effectively settled the case by providing the refund and then without uh, addressing at all the substantive legal points uh, that the Jarrett's raised. So my understanding is that this case is currently being appealed. So we should sort of follow it and, and see what happens. Um, the uh, New, York Bar, New York State Bar Association uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, released a pretty comprehensive paper on, um, you know, their their views and uh, their analysis on what should be the appropriate tax treatment for a whole series of transactions that we're now seeing um, in the in the crypto or digital asset space, and one of the transactions that they that they cover is is uh, staking, um, and in that report, um, and you know Kevin was a part of uh, the, that exercise with the New York State Bar Association. Um, in that report, they uh, did find that you know most likely or you know, the most appropriate sort of characterization for staking rewards um, is services, even though they acknowledge that there is this, you know, other 
um, position out there based around the fact that it could potentially be also considered self um, self created property. So, you know, this is the, you know, keep your eye on the space. I do think it's incredibly interesting. And especially now as we're sort of entering, um, you know, a down market and people are sort of looking at uh, higher, you know, uh, you know, low risk uh, paths to potentially higher yields. Um, I do think more and more people will enter um, the staking space. Now this question of like liquid versus illiquid staking, well, based on the protocol, um, uh, you know, in order to sort of be a validator with a large stake, oftentimes um, that stake has to be held for a certain period of time. And so uh, the tokens that are to then, you know, sort of uh, delegated to be used um, as, um, you know, for validation, uh, they oftentimes, um, you know, it's, it's almost like the equivalent of sort of being locked in some type of CD for a set period of time. Um, with penalties, you know, if you were to um, early redeem that certificate. Uh, here it's a very sort of comparable analogy. And so uh, what we're now seeing on the market is there are providers that offer liquid staking, which is effectively a, a representation token that is issued on the underlying stake. So for example, let's say you have, you know, 100 Ethereum, right? And, um, and so, you know, many of you know Ethereum is moving towards a staking-based protocol, but that it hasn't yet sort of become live yet. So, uh, so let's say you have 100 Ethereum and you're interested in staking it into this sort of Ethereum 2.0 protocol. Um, you know, once you sort of stake it, it's, uh, you know, it's locked in for a certain period of time um, until the, um, that protocol is actually launched. Um, publicly. And so what some people are doing is they're offering sort of representation tokens to say, okay, well, you know, if you have a, you know, you staked 100 Ethereum, but we're going to issue you sort of this, you know, 100, like, let's say, you know, rep coin, right? And that 100 rep coin will essentially represent the underlying 100 Ethereum. And then the rep coin itself, which is the representation token, could then be traded or sold or transferred which then, you know, of course, transfers the rights to the underlying under Ethereum. Great, that's really helpful. Um, we're gonna launch our first polling question, as mentioned, um, in order to qualify for CPE, you need to satisfy the questions. Um, you don't have to get it right, but hopefully you do as we just answered this, which is how is cryptocurrency treated for tax purposes as currency or property? Um, there was a question that we received as far as you know programs to track bitcoin basis and and the like you know I, I do know that there's some software out there but it's also akin to how shareholders have to track their basis in their investments uh, and so really it's a matter of um, how you want to go about doing it and what mechanics or or protocols you use to actually acquire your cryptocurrency will possibly be helpful in establishing what your basis is. Um, while they're still answering the, the question though, Chris, uh, Congress seems more fixated on reporting than on the substantive tax rules right now. And so I guess it would be helpful if, if you sort of, for everyone, highlighted some of the reporting obligations that you know US taxpayers are gonna have in the near future. Sure. So this got a lot of attention um, last year through the infrastructure bill that was ultimately passed because there was a provision in there, a couple provisions in there related to crypto reporting. Um, the main one that got the most controversy was that they extended the definition of broker to cover a lot of players and actors in, in the crypto space. Um, and what that practically means is that, um, you know, exchanges that are transacting in crypto um, will have to provide a 1099 uh, form to allow their uh, customers to be able to report their taxes properly, just like a stockbroker would have to do so. Um, this got a lot of attention because the definition of broker was defined very broadly, but the good news is that Treasury uh, sent a letter to the Senate saying that we're actually going to, you know, narrow this definition um, and only apply it to really companies and exchanges that have the ability to report 
uh, this information to their customers and exclude a lot of the validators and other actors that may not have access to this information. So I think that was some positive news. Um, what's also interesting from the infrastructure bill is that uh, right now, if a company receives more than $10,000 in cash, that has to be reported on form 8300. But they extended that as well to include receipts of payments for crypto that exceed $10,000. Uh, which companies may not realize is more and more start to accept cryptocurrency as, as payment. Every single payment that exceeds $10,000 has to be uh, reported, which is quite uh, an administrative burden. Um, so something to be aware of, both of those are coming 2023. Um, and then also, uh, the IRS has updated their form 14457. Um, this is for voluntary compliance uh, to avoid criminal penalties. Uh, for past non-compliance, and they've extended this as well to allow taxpayers who did not comply uh, with reporting their crypto transactions properly in the past to come forward um, and get uh, relief, uh, at least from criminal uh, prosecution. You still owe the tax you owe and the interest and penalties you owe, but at least uh, you won't have to, to go to jail for this. So it's sort of a nice thing that has come recently. No, that's great. And, you know, we have to be mindful of, you know, we have these U.S. reporting obligations. That checkbox is going to become exceptionally important, uh, especially when we start thinking about crypto losses. As I've heard rumors that the service may be saying, okay, if you're planning to claim these losses, did you ever report that you ever had the, the crypto in the first place? So it may be a little bit difficult to claim a loss if you never reported that you did have the crypto. But Turning our attention to the OECD, Liz, what are you hearing in the sense of, I know that they recently released a framework, you know, what are the challenges? What does it say? What should we be looking for in the future? Yeah, um, and Kevin, actually, um, I'd like to make a couple comments on the prior slide. So if we could go back really quickly on the US framework. So here I do think, you know, on, um, you know, something that sort of um, hasn't really been discussed yet. And I, I uh, um, I think the impact is more on the reporting intermediaries, uh, but um, in terms of the uh, you know operational uh, challenges. But it's really you know there was an amendment in the infrastructure bill uh, that was passed um, last summer that um, actually modified and expanded the obligations of these uh, digital asset reporting intermediaries. So centralized exchanges. Um, that's under 6045 cap A. And it actually expanded their obligations to, I want to say beginning 2025, they are required to also report the destination wallet address of um, any customer that transfers tokens off their platform. Now, I think, you know, many of you may think that that sounds pretty innocuous, but there are a number of um, concerns with something like that, because as Chris, you know, mentioned um, in his introductory remarks, uh, the, uh, the blockchain is a permanent ledger of every single transaction that's ever occurred on that ledger, you know, with respect to like, you know, certain wallet addresses, it's a permanent record of all time. And so as an example, you know, if there is a link with an identity between, um, you know, a, a sort of verified known identity at a wallet address, and that is somehow collected um, by uh, the government and then shared with other countries as a part of exchange of information or automatic exchange of information, then, um, you know, then all the transactions for all time that go into and out of that wallet address become known and linked to individual, to actual identities. And so um, this is sort of akin in many ways to providing you know, the, um, the tax authorities, you know, as a part of routine reporting um, transactional details, very similar to, you know, detailed bank transactions or detailed credit card statements. And so I don't think that that was intended uh, in terms of, you know, what was proposed, but I do think that that is the practical effect of, uh, of you know, this new um, 6045 Cap A. And the OECD is actually proposing something similar in the CAR framework, so the crypto asset reporting framework. So there, um, you know, and we actually see many uh, similarities between what's being proposed in the CAR framework and 
you know, what was um, what the U.S. has put forth uh, in the infrastructure bill that was passed last summer. So the first is uh, that the definition of crypto assets um, is, uh, you know, defined to be uh, a digital representation of value that relies on a cryptographically secure distributed ledger or a similar technology to validate and secure transactions. So needless to say, that is an incredibly broad definition. Um, and, um, and so, you know, at this point, it's, it's just in proposed form. So we're still working, um, industry is working with um, both the OECD and, and governments to uh, try to, um, you know, make some of make the framework a little bit more proportional uh, to actually meet the the needs of um, governments to risk assess for tax tax compliance. But yeah, one of the issues is really the breadth of the definition of crypto assets. It's currently so broad that it's not even aligned with the definition of crypto assets that's in the uh, you know the the FATA framework, which uh, governs AML KYC, um, and uh, and the FATA definition. Uh, is a similar definition, but it is limited to tokens that are used as a form of payment or for investment. Um, whereas the, the definition that's currently in the CARF is not limited. Uh, the other is around uh, reporting intermediaries. So even though the definition of reporting intermediaries is pretty broad as it's written in the CARF, um, we've had sort of key uh, government delegates, uh, you know, at least verbally say that you know the intent was for the reporting intermediaries to be limited to um, effectively centralized exchanges um, and uh, and others that you know are um, you know sort of regulated entities that um, onboard and offboard customers and on ramp and off ramp customers from fiat into crypto and crypto back to fiat uh, I think the other thing is sort of for folks to know is that this car framework that's being proposed it's not in lieu of CRS, right, or FATCA. It would be on top of CRS and FATCA. It is a separate additional regime uh, that intermediate, intermediate, sorry, excuse me, reporting intermediaries um, would be required to uh, comply with, right, if it, if it does pass. Um, then the other sort of, you know, thing I think to put on folks' radar is uh, the information that's being requested. So the delegates have um, verbalized that, you know, the intent is to request proportional information so that governments around the world um, have enough transparent information to be able to risk assess whether their taxpayers are complying, right, with the rules. Um, that is, are they reporting, um, you know, crypto gains effectively? Now, I think one of the challenges with, with that is that I do think it's really hard to come up with a reporting framework where you're, um, requesting, uh, you know, proportional data and information um, when there's no, there's not yet a framework on the substantive tax treatment of these transactions. So if there's no agreement or no guidance globally around how transactions should be treated for tax purposes, and as an example, right, like right now, you know, Germany just passed rules saying that crypto assets held uh, for uh, more than 12 months are not subject to tax under German law. Um, I believe France has a rule where crypto to crypto exchanges are not taxable. Um, I'm not sure if they've recently changed those rules, but that was certainly the case a few years ago. Um, and so, you know, country by country, these rules are very different. Um, and so before sort of, I think, uh, requiring that intermediaries provide an awful lot of information about people, um, it would make sense to me that um, there first be uh, some alignment and coherence on the substantive tax treatment of these crypto transactions first, um, or at least in parallel, right, with the reporting work stream. So I think, you know, similarly, what we're seeing then in terms of what's being asked to be reported, it's just an awful lot of information. I mean, right now for CRS, uh, you know, what's required to be reported is maybe a bank account number, as well as balances, account balances. Um, what's being asked for in the CARF, um, it's, uh, you know, asset by asset reporting. So, you know, for example, it's no longer going to be a balance that, you know, a, a taxpayer would have at a digital asset exchange. The digital asset exchange, for example, um, under the CARF would be required to report asset by asset. So, you know, units of Ethereum, 
um, as well as the fiat value um, units of you know Bitcoin, fiat value, and so on and so forth. Um, so it is certainly an expansion of what's currently required under CRS. Um, I do think that it does indirectly get to transaction by transaction reporting because of the uh, of the requirement for reporting intermediaries to also report on any off-platform transfers to a destination wallet address. So this would be, you know, typically some type of uh, self-hosted wallet address. Perhaps, you know, it's um, a different exchange. But the way that these wallet addresses exist um, on the various protocols, it's difficult to know sort of who owns that destination wallet address. Um, some exchanges require that the customer sort of like self-report the destination wallet address. So I, I'm aware some exchanges will sort of send out a questionnaire asking the customer to you know check like yes I'm sending it to my own wallet you know my own self custody self hosted wallet or like or check you know I'm sending it to a different exchange. Um, but all of this information, if it's required to then be reported as a part of routine tax reporting, then links the identity with um, specific wallet addresses. And um, and again, you know, once you have a wallet address, you type it into a pro, you know a block explorer, right? Which are like search engines for blockchains, and um, you then can see like literally within a second all the transactions for all time that have ever interacted in or out of that particular wallet address. And then you can also then you know track it as well, right? So let's say one wallet address transfers tokens to another wallet address. You can then type in that other wallet address and then see all the transactions that have happened for all time with that other wallet address. So, you know, using sort of actually the construct of these um, very transparent um, public blockchains, you know, authorities could actually very quickly cobble together sort of a visual of all the social interactions and all the financial interactions of individuals with each other, right? And it is a certain, it's a very, it's a lot of information and a lot of, um, I think, you know, transparency, not just on financial transactions, but for everything, right? Because keep in mind, you know, many charities and donations are now also accepting, um, you know, payments in, in or donations in, in digital assets, as well as, you know, political, political, um, groups. And so I think very quickly, there are all sorts of, you know, privacy related concerns with um, the amount of information that's um, being um, requested under the carve. So it's something that we're continuing to work on. And uh, we're continuing to sort of do what we can to, um, you know, coordinating and, and um, engage with uh, the uh, uh, tax policymakers at the OECD and in the US um, to just better understand whether this amount of data that's being requested was it intended? Um, and if it wasn't intended, you know, what can we do to try to put some guardrails in place? You know, this is really helpful. If this doesn't scare you as far as um, all the information that needs to be potentially turned over, uh, it reminds me of when people started using the untraceable burner phones, people are going to start thinking of the untraceable um, burner wallets, uh, just for sole purposes of saying, okay, here you go, but then how do you even get the currency in there without ever tracing it? So it, it'll be a, an interesting dynamic, but I guess being mindful of the time, Chris, knowing what the market looks like now, um, People are, are, are seeing stock prices as well as crypto prices falling. You know, what should they know? How can they potentially utilize that for their advantage for a tax perspective? Yeah, tough, tough times right now, but maybe that's an opportunity for, for tax savings. Um, generally, when you sell a token for a loss and you're holding it as a, an investor, that's going to give rise to a capital loss. Uh, as, as we all know, capital losses have some limitations. They can only be offset against capital gains. And for individuals, only $3,000 per year can be offset against ordinary income. Um, so selling um, a token for a capital loss, uh, even if huge, may have limited utility. Granted, you can carry it forward, um, but may not have so much utility today. Um, one nice thing you might want to consider is what's called a wash sale. So a wash sale is when uh, you sell, uh, for example, a token for a loss, and then you buy it right back at the same price. So 
so that you're no different economically than you were before, but now you've locked in this large, you know, loss that you can again use for for tax purposes at the end of the year. And um, you know, the general rules of wash sales are you have to wait 30 days, for example, if you're doing this with stock, to buy back the same stock. But that rule doesn't apply to crypto yet. The Build Back Better Act tried to uh, expand it to crypto, but that obviously didn't get passed. So this strategy for now still still works. And so, you know, for any of your crypto um, uh, tokens with a built-in loss, you might want to execute a wash sale uh, sooner rather than later. Um, the other thing that might be worth mentioning is what's called an abandonment loss. So abandonment losses are nice because they're actually treated as ordinary losses and not capital losses for, for tax purposes. And how do they work? So literally, instead of selling your token for a loss, uh, you abandon the token um, and you demonstrate some contemporaneous intent, uh, such as writing a letter to your CPA or your lawyer saying, I intend to abandon this token. And then you can send it to, for example, they have what's, what's called burn wallets, which are just wallets that literally burn tokens, send it there. Um, so you are physically abandoning it. And the nice thing about this is that, you know, the case law allows this and the token doesn't need to be worthless. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be held in a business. Um, and, you know, tokens, are acceptable. So, for example, uh, there was a token Luna that significantly declined in value recently, um, and it's pretty much almost worthless at this point. Um, and a lot of people are trying to get out, but you know, selling again is only going to give rise to a capital gain. Better to abandon the token instead and, and derive an ordinary loss. That's great. So we're going to launch the next polling question. Um, and while they're answering, Chris, you know, as we've talked about a lot, there's a lot to do. Um, the agenda was was quite ambitious. We've been talking for about 40 minutes now. Let's let's keep the conversation going. You know, I've heard of, of NFTs, right? And that's something that's a hot topic. Um, definitely trying to figure out what they are and, and how they're used. So what what can you tell us about them? Sure. So NFTs are certainly a hot topic in this area. And what is an NFT? So we've been talking about fungible tokens so far. Uh, and fungible tokens are just that. You know, one Bitcoin is no different than another Bitcoin. They're all interchangeable and equally uh, have value and abuse. Uh, a non-fungible token, as the name describes, uh, each one is, is different. Um, and this came up because people were starting to create uh, digital art, digital music, um, you know, even like sports highlights, um, and attaching these unique objects to the blockchain, and therefore, uh, you know, deriving a type of token, an NFT, that represents a specific, uh, you know, specific asset, right? And um, these got popular because uh, they were tradable and deriving large valuations. Question is, how do we tax an NFT, right? Um, and you know, like the fungible tokens, uh, how you hold the NFT could, you know, differ depending upon how the tax treatment. Um, if it's held as a capital asset, well, there's a specific set of capital assets called collectibles which has a higher tax rate, 28%, instead of the, the normal 15 to 20% for regular capital assets. So arguably an NFT could be taxed as a collectible, although if you read the statute, it seems to only pertain to tangible assets and not intangible assets. So some, some debate there. Um, another issue with NFTs is that, you know, while you can sell an NFT for a specific price, on a, a marketplace or an exchange, some NFTs continue bearing royalties back to the original creator uh, in perpetuity. Um, and so, you know, what is the treatment of those royalties uh, is sort of an interesting tax question 
um, as well. And then uh, in terms of the creators themselves, uh, like a lot of artists, they are, don't get the favorable tax treatment uh, that investors get. Um, any gain from selling an NFT uh, that you create is going to be ordinary uh, income. The nice thing is you can deduct some expenses incurred in uh, creating the NFT, but you don't get the capital gain uh, treatment. So, so a lot more to come on NFTs uh, in the future. You know, that's that's great. I know that you know, being mindful of the time, our next slide that we had a, a hot topic was was DAOs, but I think we're going to launch the next polling question. Um, and so, which crypto company first went public? Chris, while they're answering that polling question, if you wanted to sort of at a very high level um, highlight some of the, the DAO questions that you've heard or seen, um, so that way we still have time to talk about token compensation as well as Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick because we could probably do a whole uh, webinar just on DAOs. So what is a DAO? A DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization, which is a mouthful, but really all it is is a new type of company form that exists solely on the blockchain um, as opposed to being you know, legally registered with any particular state. And so the idea here is instead of having a company that's run by a board of directors or a CEO, can we have a a decentralized company where it's run by the people, by the holders of the tokens in the DAO. So that's, that's the general concept. And we've seen some of this uh, in practice. DAOs are starting to buy assets, uh, run companies. Um, uh, and, you know, obviously there's a lot, a lot of potential here. What people that form DAOs may not realize is that there's a, a huge legal and tax potential liability that comes with forming a DAO because even though a DAO is not a legal entity, uh, law and tax can actually deem there to be an entity even where one doesn't exist. So for example, uh, if you have a, a two people that share profits and losses, that is a deemed partnership uh, under tax law and you have to deal with the partnership tax laws. So you know, schedule K-1 reporting, flow through taxation to the partners, all of that comes with uh, a potential DAO without any sort of uh, legal wrapper. Um, so to fix this, there's some jurisdictions that allow you to register their DAO. Wyoming has a very good law. Some foreign jurisdictions came in Malta. You can register a DAO. And so we're, you know, advising clients to look at this to protect yourself, not only for tax purposes, but also from any legal liability that may result from forming or owning a DAO. And um, really quickly, I know that we had a technical issue with the third polling question. Um, if you answer the last polling question that will be coming up, you will still be eligible for credit. So um, have no fear. Uh, Chris, really quickly, you know, what should we know about token compensation? Uh, knowing that we have, you know, just two to three minutes to cover this and also the, the Green Book proposals. Yeah, so just quickly on token compensation, because many companies are starting to use tokens as a way to compensate their employees. Um, and it's an effective instrument because in many cases, you can align the employees' goals and incentives with the company by offering them tokens. Plus, you can also give them some tax advantages like we would with some stock and equity compensation instruments. So we've seen, for example, like restricted stock, restricted tokens, where an employee receives a token that vests over a few years, um, and can make an 83B election to pay a little tax today, not pay tax when it vests, but then pay tax when it's ultimately sold for capital gain. And if the value of the token is low when received, then that's a pretty, that can be a pretty good outcome from a tax standpoint. Um, similar concept with RSUs we see with restricted token units. The one thing that I would mention is that token options, it's not quite clear that they actually work under 409 Cap A. 
which seems to only allow options on service recipient stock. So just be careful there if you're dealing with any options on uh, on tokens. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. And I guess just some last thoughts uh, to highlight. We we've talked about in the past the green book, the administration's green book, and what does it mean to have a green book? And noting that obviously these are mere proposals from the administration. They're not even proposals from members of Congress. And so, you know, being mindful of that is always one of those questions as far as, well, how likely is anything to be picked up and included in legislation, but also realizing that any time that there is either a legislative proposal or a proposal included in the Green Book, if it's not enacted now, if there's always a likelihood or a possibility at least that it could be picked up off the shelf in a subsequent year and said, okay, let's pull it and say, let's include it in another year. So even though we're saying, okay, well, chances are these proposals may or may not be included and we're really not sure of the status of the BBBA, um, Chris, what should we know about in the crypto space as far as the administration's proposals? Yeah, just quickly, the substantive proposals are actually pretty helpful. Uh, for example, um, currently you can lend stock or securities um, and not have a non-recognition event when doing so. They're gonna extend that to allow lending of crypto, which uh, lending and borrowing of crypto has become a, a very uh, important uh, utility in the crypto space. So that's a very favorable proposal that I hope gets passed. The other one that's favorable is allowing dealers and traders to mark to market their positions, not only in crypto, not only in stocks and securities, but also uh, in crypto by making an election, which um, is great because that makes their administrative burden of dealing a dealer, being a dealer or trader, a lot more manageable. So two two proposals that I think are favorable that I hope get get passed. In addition, uh, more reporting to come. No surprise there. FATCA reporting to come. 8938 reporting to come. That's just a general trend with our government. More and more reporting. Um, but overall, uh, some some good proposals that I hope do get announced. No, that's that's really helpful. And Chris, thanks again for for joining us. And also, you know, Liz, thanks for for joining us earlier. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin DeYoung to help show us Answer Connect. Excellent, thanks, Kevin. Um, great information from the three of you. Appreciate you putting that all together for us. Um, you're right, Kevin. Really aggressive agenda. Um, probably could have spent a little bit more time on it, but uh, again. Thanks for putting all that work together. Before I start, just want to make sure Answer Connect is actually showing up on the screen. If somebody can give me the thumbs up yep. from our panelist group, excellent. What I really wanted to spend a couple minutes focusing on today was CCH Answer Connect. We're going to take a look at how you know we can assist with the research related to cryptocurrency. But before we get into that, I want to just take a couple of minutes as we launched, launched CCH Answer Connect a few years ago. We wanted to take some time to really rethink the process of tax research and what that workflow looks like, um, where the data is currently housed, where you have to go to pull information from explanations to code sections to regulations to cases, um, some of that administrative guidance that we're waiting for regarding this specific issue that's going to be coming down the line. And as we take a look at CCH Answer Connect, really want to focus primarily on how we were able to take this information and put it into a system that allows for a more streamlined, more effective tax research workflow. So as we go through this, just kind of keep that in mind as we look. So what I'm going to actually do here is run a really quick search on cryptocurrency and want to show some of the advantages of what we've done with CCH Answer Connect. Um, as we look and we start to type, we've put intuitive search language in here where we're going to try guiding you as a tax researcher into areas where we feel your information is going to be housed. And as we look at our search results here, we've got a very high level discussion on how is Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency tax. Again, very, very high level piece of information here with links to additional content. As I scroll further down, I have several topic pages. This is new content for us specifically. Our editorial team went out and created thousands of these topic pages where we're able to give you that high level overview of what the issue is, what it means, and then allow the user as a researcher to dive into the next level of content. 
And then of course, we also have our suggested searches based on what we're seeing from our customers as they're running and conducting searches throughout our platforms. So for today's case, I'm actually gonna run the search on cryptocurrency just to kind of take a look at what we have available for you in terms of the content. And as we've heard several times today, many times today, we are waiting on guidance. Um, we know it's coming. We, it's gonna be a lot of it when it does come out, but I wanna show you the framework of what we've established that will allow CCH to continue to update you as the researcher in these specific areas. So we're gonna start in our federal area under our cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrency issue tax topic. And as I mentioned, these topic pages are gonna give you that high level overview just as an introduction and then as we scroll through these pages, we're going to go deeper and deeper into the content set as it relates to cryptocurrency. You know, what are some of the general rules for cryptocurrency? Are there miscellaneous cryptocurrency issues that we wanna make you aware of? Um, that type of information, again, following that workflow, we're then going to give you the ability to see some additional content sets that you might look at. Uh, for example, we heard quite a bit of talk today regarding cryptocurrency reporting, uh, waiting on a lot of guidance regarding that, as well as some other topics that are out there, the capital gains issues that we heard talked about specifically, um, the FBAR, FACBA, all that information is going to be here as well for you to jump to. What the editorial team has also done as we move through the process and the workflow of tax research is linking the ability to link out directly to code sections. Um, to get further guidance, whether it's the uh, the IRS, it's whether it's the um, regulations that we're waiting on, CCH explanations. And again, we're going to take a look at this in a second. Um, I do want to just really quickly point out, for example, the other IRS materials. I know we made reference to a couple of the notices that are out there and some of the rulings. We've also put them in this location. So again, as a researcher, you're not leaving a common platform or location to go find additional content, the editorial team has brought that to you. We've also then brought together various tools, uh, client letters in this case, um, communication tools you can use to just inform your clients of the changes that are happening within this specific space. And then we've also brought in news. Um, again, we're going to see a lot of activity in this um, over the coming days, weeks, and months. So again, this is where we'll have that information housed for you. For the time being, I am actually just going to jump over to uh, code section 61. Again, just to show you an example of how the tax research workflow has been changed within CCH Answer Connect. The page that is drawing here is what we have defined as our 360 view, meaning all related content. Sorry, I was just pinged here. Is my screen still coming through? Yes, it is, Kevin. Okay, thanks. Um, so within this 360 view, if you think about how research was previously conducted, you might start in that code section and then there would be references and links out to specific regulations. When you would click those, you would leave the code database, go to a separate database for regulations, and then you might have to click on several other links to get to explanations or cases or guidance or whatever that information you needed to work through the workflow of this research process. We've now put all of this information to you in one screen. You have the ability to go from your codes, your regs, your explanations, um, administrative guidance, tools. There's also going to be a section in here as we deal with more cryptocurrency um, regarding the federal state comparison. You know, have the states adopted? Have they modified? Have they completely decoupled from the federal provision as it pertains to the issue of cryptocurrency? Again, all of that will be located for you on a single screen. I'm gonna go back to my federal topic page here and go back to my search results just to continue with how we're giving information to you regarding these issues. I wanna actually open up one of our news articles from our client impact events, which is our cryptocurrency and virtual currency guidance issued. This came out actually early part of last month, but again, this is another way that within CCH Answer Connect, we're able to better help the tax researcher understand the issues and communicate that information directly with their clients. So as we walk through the navigation bar, um, the overview of the issue, we've got our client application, who this affects, the profile. We've talked about the recommended topics from the previous page. All of that information is here as well. The ability to link out to those code sections, take your research even to a deeper level. 
and then any client letters. Um, we saw these previously. And the one other piece I do want to point out on this page, it was also on the federal cryptocurrency page, is our CPE courses. Again, this is an emerging issue. We know there's going to be changes. We're going to give you that information within the topic pages and within the explanations. But if you need to dive deeper, you want to get more education on this, we do have the ability to link directly to those learning tools from the actual topic page itself. Looking at the time here, it is just about 12 o'clock. Um, so with that, again, we would appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, talk further with you about CCH Answer Connect, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sharon for our final polling question. Thank you, Kevin, um, for that great demonstration, and thanks to all of our fantastic panelists for a great and informative discussion today. This will be the final polling question. Would you like a more in-depth demonstration or further details on the resources and tools available in CCH Answer Connect. Um, this question will remain up as we wrap up today's event. This virtual coffee talk will conclude once this polling question is completed. As a reminder, there will also be a few quick survey questions to you to complete following the, following the webinar. We appreciate any feedback. For Again, um, we apologize for the technical difficulty in the middle um, with the third poll, with the third interactive polling question. Um, please note if you have stayed the whole time and have answered the, the interactive questions, you can expect to receive an email within two to four business days with instructions on how to access your CPE certification cert, certificate. Please note the instructions will be sent to the email you used to enroll for today's event. Thank you to all for attending our May virtual coffee talk, and we will leave that question up for another 30 seconds. And this concludes our webinar today. See you next time.